of your God. Now, <laughs> that's quite big. I could probably leave that up there for the next 20 minutes and just let you muster over that, and that's my job done. Um, but basically there, the reason I've included that is his words really sum up for me the importance of our call to live a life that consistently reflects Christ in every conversation, in every circle, situation, disagreement, agreement, discussion, and every single crevice of our lives. And however that quote and those questions are making you feel right now, I want you to just hold on to that and bear with that as we go through the next bunch of slides. So just bear with that thought as we move through. So like I mentioned, um, I'm going to be sharing a little bit on discipleship and um, kind of what discipleship should look like and what it should look like in every situation, discussion, agreement, disagreement, meeting, circle of friends, etc. But I want to tell you why I'm sharing on that today and kind of where this has come from. So when Ed asked me, um, is it right if I take this off? Yeah, just because I tend to move around a bit. And, yeah, cool. There we go. Um, when Ed asked me if I was up for sharing, I said, absolutely, I'd love to share. And then probably within about an hour of thinking of it, I knew exactly what I needed to share on. I knew what God was putting on my heart. And I nearly texted Ed and said, you know what, maybe next time. The reason being, this is very, very, what I'm sharing on is quite current and very, very new and us almost a little bit vulnerable sharing about it. But I knew exactly what it was that God had placed on my heart for a number of months and a lot recently. So I'm just going to share a little bit of a backstory. About six to eight weeks ago, I was up in Cardiff with a mate. Uh, we went up for the weekend. We went up to watch a gig and then we did some shopping and kind of um, more lad stuff than shopping. But you know what I mean? We're up in, we're up there for the weekend and I met my friend's girlfriend. And for the first time, never met her before. And we're having loads of conversations, getting to know each other. And I happen to share, don't get too excited. This is past tense. But I happen to share that I've been dating a Christian girl. Now, fast forward to the middle of the week, and I'm having a conversation with him on the phone. And he says, I said, oh, it was good, wasn't it? And he said, yeah. And then he said, uh, his girlfriend said, what, what business has John got dating a Christian girl? And I was like, okay, it's a bit harsh. Um, <laughs> And then I said, so, so what do you mean by that? Or, or what did she mean, mate? And she said, oh, she didn't realise you were a Christian. And I was like, okay. I, I, I didn't go up to her and say, I'm John, the Christian. Nice to meet you. But I was a bit like, okay, that, that, that's, that's fair enough. And he said, yeah, I told her and she was shocked. So I was like, okay, you could have kept that one to yourself, thanks. Um, and then um, I said, why is that? And she said, oh, just the way you are. So we kept on going. And... As, as kind of humorous and funny as that conversation was, actually, it did really stri strike a chord. Spent the weekend um, with my mate and meeting his girlfriend, and it was shocking to her that I was a Christian because of the way I was. So that was a big wake-up call. Um, I didn't get specifics. I didn't want to ask, to be honest. Um, but it was, it was a big wake-up call, and that didn't sit right or okay with me for, 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 for weeks. Fast forward two weeks later, and we're in Deeper, which is the youth Bible study, which me and Becky Clement sort of co-lead. They asked a fascinating question. They asked a load of questions, uh, uh, and that's what we're doing our series on. And one of them was the deaths of the disciples. We did not want to spend an hour lingering on that. So we looked at what does it look like to be a disciple? So I did a lot of, looked into that, and it was a massive learning curve for me. And I was about to go in there to deliver to, the, to this youth group of what it looks like to be bold and to be a disciple of God. And I was thinking, well, the stuff I was preaching on, which we'll look at in a minute, I was like, well, I was going in there and thinking, well, people aren't seeing this in every corner of my life. So it was quite hard. And that's where this has come from and this whole reflection. So like I said, we're going to look more into that discipleship and we're going to start by looking at Jesus's first and last direct commands to Peter. His first and last direct commands to Peter. Okay, and it's really, really interesting. So if I go to, I've got the scriptures up here, feel free to turn to them. Um, but if we go to Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 to 19, you've got, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were cast in a net into the lake for they were fishermen. Come, follow me. Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. So that's the first direct command Jesus gives directly to Peter. Come, follow me. 
if you were to read on to verse 22, you'll find that Peter and Andrew left everything and they went to, to follow Jesus just two verses later. Or Luke chapter 5, verse 1 paraphrases saying they forsook all. They left absolutely everything. I'm actually not, that's, you know, massive. I'm actually not going to dive into that. What I want us to focus on is that first directive from Jesus to Peter was come follow me. Now hold that one in your head as well as the first slide, which I told you to keep in your head as well. Uh, hold that one in your head while we go on to the last direct instruction that Jesus gave directly to Peter. This is before the Great Commission, the Great Commission where he gave direct instructions to a wider group. But in John chapter 21, verse 22, we've got again, Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. So for context in the previous verse, Jesus has just predicted Simon Peter's death. Simon Peter turns around, sees John coming, and he says, what about him? And Jesus says, no, don't want him to think about what's going on out there. Don't worry about that. That's, good. That's got nothing to do with you. For you, all I want you to do, fix your eyes on me. Follow me. That's all I want for you. So the, let me just go forward in my notes. It's quite interesting that the first direct command from Jesus to Peter is follow me. And the second direct command, sorry, the last direct command from Jesus to Peter, follow me. Two exactly the same phrases, but with different implications, different tones of voice and different intentions. Because it's the same words, but it's a completely different point in Peter's journey. So let's just do a little bit more digging into those. In our first instance, in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus is walking past the Sea of Galilee, and he says, come follow me. Jesus recognize, Peter sorry, recognizes Jesus as a rabbi, as a teacher, as a leader, and he does follow him in the context of becoming his um, student. He sees him as a teacher, and he does leave everything, and he follows him in the context of, I'm going to go follow this teacher, and I'm going to go learn from him. So that's that's your first follow me. We could call it, come learn from me. Come be my student. Come learn about what I've got to tell you. Fast forward to John 21, our second follow me. A lot has happened. You've had all of Jesus' ministry. Peter's denied Jesus three times. Jesus has been crucified. Jesus has risen. Peter and Jesus have just wrapped up quite an emotional and confrontational discussion where Jesus asks Peter three times, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And Jesus has just predicted Simon Peter's death as well. Now, after this conversation, Peter loses focus. He turns around, he sees John come in, he gets distracted. And he says, well, what about his fate then? And again, Jesus brings him back and he says, I don't want you to think about that. All you need to focus on is follow me. You see, it's the exact same words, but the second time, the intent and the compassion are just completely different. Jesus is saying, fix your eyes on me. So for Peter, discipleship in its first instance is that beginning phase, is follow Jesus, learn about him, become his student and learn from him. And then the idea of discipleship that Jesus left Peter with was through that process, in amongst everything, in amongst all the troubles and toils of this world, stay close to him. But there is a little bit more to that one as well, because Jesus wants us to be motivated by our love for him to do that. He asks Peter three times, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And then he says, okay, well, I want you to follow me. So those are our first two of three points. You've got your two follow me's from Jesus to Peter. The first one being learn from me. I want you to become my student. I want you to learn from me. And the second one through that, through it all, stay close to me. We're going to be a bit cheeky and we're going to take those two and we're going to split them and we're going to slide one in between just, just to keep you on your toes and make it more confusing for you. So um, to do that, to get our third leg to the stool or whatever you want to call it, we're going to actually look at the Great Commission, which is the passage which Ed opened with. And if we just read through just the words here, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Jesus' last instructions to a wider group of those disciples. See, the role of the disciples wasn't just to teach others, but to practice those exact teachings. Practice so others wouldn't only hear of the teachings of Christ and the love of Christ and the radical love of Christ, but that they would see it as well. Actions speak louder than words. That's a common phrase, but it's really, really applicable here. What we found in Deeper when the disciples did this is it actually resulted in two things. When the disciples learned from Jesus and actioned it, it resulted in two very distinct things. First one was the growth of the church. People saw throughout the nations this radical, this new love. They, they heard it and they saw it in the actions of the disciples and it caught on and disciples were made. The church grew throughout those nations. Second distinct part was that we found out in deeper was that 10 of those original 12 were then executed and put to death for that because that radical love and that way of living did not fit the Roman regime and the agendas of those in power. Now I've completely, I know I've completely skimmed over this passage and you can probably do like an hour on that passage at least and I know Jim Probert did in the summer so that's a good one to go back and watch but that's our third one, live in action by that of what you teach. So we've got our three and now just as I attempt to start bringing it all together, you can probably see some of that journey that I've been on, where I went into deeper, I taught what it looks like to be a disciple of Jesus. You learn from him and then you action it. And then I think back to my conversation I had with my friend who said, my girlfriend, when she met you, was shocked that you were a Christian. So you can now see where all of this has come from. I don't think you can teach something so bold as that without authentically and really teach something and preach something as bold of that without walking away and really, really thinking about where you fit in within that. And that was a massive wake up call. And scripture, th this whole thing of teaching and, and um, practicing what you preach and acting as you teach is echoed throughout scripture. And I've got, there's loads of examples, but I've got a few of my favorite ones here, starting with James. I love reading James. He's literally straight to the point doesn't really mess around um do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves do what it says or another way to put it is don't just listen to the word do it jesus's words in john 14 if you love me you will keep my commandments and then paul when he's writing to the romans for it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in god's sight but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous so I know that I found this. I know that I found this, and we probably all have found this in some way, shape, or form. When somebody knows you're a Christian, you will be under the microscope, CCTV will be on you, you'll be under the magnifying glass, and people will scrutinize you. People are going to watch how you're going to act in every single situation because you profess to be a Christian. And that's hard. It's literally like Big Brother. I don't watch Big Brother. That was an analogy. Please don't think I watch it. And whilst actually sometimes this is often a reason that we retract and we pull away, actually what I've been learning is it's the actual reason not to. We should live a life which actions the biblical teachings because people's eyes are on us. We shouldn't retract and start to go into our shell, but because people's eyes are on us, that's why we should live a life that does reflect those same teachings. What happened when all the eyes were on Jesus' disciples? When they were teaching and when they were practicing that Christ-like love, it led a lot of people to faith and the church grew when they saw that radical love and the teachings in the lives of those people. Think back to that quote I started. Is it, is it me? I'll, I'll, yeah. yeah, you can wander around a bit. I'll push the gate. is impossibly hard if anyone figures it out let me know because you're a lifesaver now i regularly even today in work situations today in work i regularly find myself in some situations where i'm really wrestling got a situation 
this is what I want to do. This is what I should be doing. And I'm wrestling with that every day. There's situations like that all the, all the time. And what I've recently realized is Jacob actually wrestled God. He didn't metaphorically wrestle with God. He actually spent the night wrestling with God. And it was only when Jacob stopped, pulled away, humbled himself before God, realized that he couldn't do it alone. And it was then that he received God's blessing and God's glory. And that's our third part, really, isn't it? That I will follow me from John 21, 22. Stay close to me through it all. You see, if I just go to the next one, just to bring the three of them together, you've got our first one, learn from him. And when you're learning from me, I want you to then go and put that into action. But you're going to need John 21, 22, because when you're putting that into action, every single set of eyes is going to be on you and it's going to be hard. And through that, you're also going to learn again. And then I want you to go and action that. I don't want you to just tell people about it. You've got to action that. And that's going to be even harder. So you've got to stay close to me through it. And then it goes round and round like, I was going to say tumbleweed, but that's definitely the wrong one. Um, like, like a cycle. Let's go like a cycle. Yeah, that one. This is exactly what Jesus expected the disciples in the time. This is exactly what he expected out of them. And that hasn't changed. It's exactly what he expects of us now. And from re my recent experience that I kind of alluded to in the first slide, I think there is work in revisiting regularly what it means to be a disciple of Christ. When I was putting that deeper session together, I was doing the research and putting a study together, and I was like, ah, I, I know what it means. And then, wow, it just dropped a whole level. I was like, right, okay, I really know what it means. Now, and I, can, I can imagine in a year's time, when I do another session like this, or when I have another experience, when I've learned some more and put some more stuff into action, stay close to God through it all again, I'll be almost like another cycle down. Just as I come to the um, last part, I do really want to leave as a last reflection the quotes from John MacArthur up on there. Um, you are the only Bible some unbelievers will ever read. Perhaps my friend's girlfriend who met me and then said those things, perhaps... I would be the only believer that she would ever meet or the only potential reflection of Christ she will ever see. That's a tall order. What do others learn from you? Do they see an accurate picture of your God? When I think of every work conversation or all, all the stuff going on in work, or my every single circle of friends I have, every situation and disagreement I've been in work, I think if I asked myself that question, I wouldn't know where, <laughs> I wouldn't know how to answer it. I wouldn't know where to begin. Just as I leave that final quote up there, another scripture which has been on my mind whilst prepping this and over the past few weeks, whilst I've been trying to be that more visible disciple, is Jesus' words in John chapter 15, verse 18. If the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. If the world hates you, Keep in mind that it hated me first. I'll um, just close to a place close and then um, I can move in. Cool. Yeah. <clears throat> thank you, Lord, for um, thank you, Lord, for the discipleship in you. Thank you, Lord, that we have a savior that we can call disciple and that we can call teacher and that we can learn from. And just like all the past disciples and all like Jacob that we can stay close to you through it all thank you that you don't expect us just to learn and go out and do it you are a Lord that understands you are a Lord that's been on this planet and has been through the same trials and worse trials and tribulations than us. you understand what it's like to show radical Christ-like love in a world that is not ready and is not willing to look for Christ-like love thank you Lord that you understand that and you can be with us through that I just pray now as we as we close our evening together with communion and more worship, help us to reflect on those questions from John MacArthur, Lord. Remind us that we are the only Bible that some unbelievers will ever see. Help us to think as we move into our weeks. Do all these people see an accurate picture of you, Lord? I know in so many walks and areas of my life that is not the truth, as I've been made aware. And I just pray, Lord, that as, as we deal and contemplate with these questions help us not to get overwhelmed lord help us to remind us that we can come to you just like you said to peter when 
everything was getting up against Peter and he was getting distracted by everything going on around him. You said, look, fix your eyes upon me, Lord. And I, I pray you'll help us to fix our eyes upon you as we consider and reflect upon this moving forward this week, Lord. Amen.